I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, chat apps, video, collaboration platforms have been the food and water of remote work over the last year. How much will we still use these tools as vaccinations roll out and workers return to the office? We'll pose that question and much more to Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield. Plus, a shocking Tesla crash leaves two men dead. Apparently no one was in the driver's seat. Was the car on autopilot? Tesla shares drop. Plus a consumer safety watchdog group says people with young children should sh stop using the Peloton treadmill. We'll have the details and reactions from both companies. And TikTok's popularity skyrocketing worldwide. It is the most downloaded, loaded non-gaming app so far this year. We're gonna go behind the dance battles, brand ambassadors and influencers to shed light on its unbelievable presence and potential in a special week-long series. All those stories in a moment, but first, IBM out with its latest report as tech earnings get underway in earnest. Bloomberg's Kriti Gupta has more on the numbers. Kriti, walk us through them. Emily Chang, uh, look at how big this kind of rally you're seeing in the post-market, this massive move here for IBM after hours. Of course, after beating revenue estimates. Now, why is this so significant? It's because it's coming after five uh, quarters of negative growth. They've actually never posted growth since all the way back in 2018. Of course, those shares having a good time in the post market. Let me bring to your attention, though, some of the other stocks that weren't doing so well in intraday trading. I want to kick it off here with NVIDIA. We really saw a little bit of pain here. You did see the UK regulator pushing back a little bit against NVIDIA's deal to, uh, to acquire the $40 billion deal on Arm Inc. That's, of course, a British semiconductor manufacturer. You also saw, of course, Tesla under pressure. You just mentioned there was that fatal car accident. Now you're seeing the safety authority really say, well, we need to launch a probe into this. And lastly, I want to bring you into Peloton. Of course, you're also seeing that warning you mentioned as well. U.S. regulators saying to be careful with their new Tread Plus machine around pets and children. Now, something else that was actually doing well, more on the green, was, of course, those Reddit trades. You saw uh, one of the latest kind of new fads in that Reddit space. Uh, That's, of course, Clover Health Insurance rallying 9.7% on a day that was largely risk off in the broader market. And of course, GameStop also rallying. You saw some good fundamentals there, uh, trading on fundamentals in theory. This idea that the CEO is actually going to leave in July, potentially uh, another sign of that revamp, Emily. All right, Kriti Gupta, thanks so much for that roundup. Now to the overall markets picture. I want to bring in our Ed Ludlow. Ed, tech quite the drag on the bigger picture. I know you've been looking at EV stocks and more. Yeah, tech basically leading stocks lower across U.S. equities. The S&P 500, the main gauge of U.S. equities, off by half, half a percent. You can see the Nasdaq 100, a very tech-heavy index, seeing greater losses down 1%. Actually, semiconductors having their worst day in around a month, down 2.5%. There was no real catalyst, just general risk-off mode, like Critty said. But it was interesting to see the yield on the U.S. 10-year Treasury up by around 2.5 basis points, 1.6%. Flip up the boards. Investors are falling out of love with tech stocks. Last year, 2020 was a gangbusters year for tech stocks. But if you look at where they're putting money, it's more to do with energy, more to do with financials, the, the pink and blue lines on my chart, those sectors that are more closely tied to an economic reopening, a real re economic recovery. Investors betting that those sectors will do better than the two main subsectors that track tech on the S&P 500. But that could all change. Flip up the boards for a final time. Because if you're a bullish name on the street, you're betting on outsized top line growth for the big names in technology. I love this chart. The, the orange bars are revenue growth in 2020. And you can see in most cases, the blue bars are the projections for fiscal 21 revenue growth expected to really be gains on last year. But there's one exception to that rule, which is Amazon. Because, of course, Amazon had such an extraordinary 2020, directly tied not just to the pandemic in terms of e-commerce, but AWS as well. So that's one thing to ask your guests going forward. How bullish are you that we'll see those outsized top line and bottom line growth from big tech? And what will that mean for broader markets going forward? All right. Ed Ludlow, thanks so much. Of course, we're going to be covering big tech earnings all week long. 
Last week, meantime, it was all about Bitcoin as prices spiked around Coinbase's public debut. Then there was a sharp drop in Bitcoin over the weekend. My next guest saying that impacted the opening trade. Let's bring in Matt Maley, chief market strategist from Miller Tabak and Company. Matt, uh, why why do you think we saw that steep decline in Bitcoin over the weekend after all of this euphoria last week? Well, yeah, and a lot of it really just had to do with the technical uh, trading, and we, and we know that it, it's really hard. There is no earnings in in Bitcoin to really gauge on valuations, uh, and you know the long term believers, and, and I'm a long term bull on it, but uh, long term believers like yeah, we, we we they fully understand that this is a long term picture, and we all know, of course, that this uh, this asset can see you know big declines of 30 to 50 percent. I mean, it has, I think it's had a 30 percent decline every year uh, for the last 10 years, and uh, and sometimes too. And so people are worried when we had that coin, you know, the Coinbase uh, uh, direct listing, people are like, oh, is this going to be a sell the news uh, situation? And initially it looked pretty good because Bitcoin rallied strongly, got up into the mid 60s, you know, 60,000s. But when it failed towards the end of the week, that uh, led a lot of the momentum people to head for the sidelines. And then, you know, thin trading over the weekend, it just fell out of bed. The thing is, though, is that on a technical basis, it still hasn't made a lower low. Uh, you know, the, again, technical analysis is very important in this in this asset right now. Its 50-day moving average is held, so that gives some people uh, uh, some important uh, um, you know, uh, safety there, I, I guess I should say. So uh, I guess my, my point is that uh, it is a risk-on, risk-off uh, situation, uh, you know, a good indicator for risk-on and risk-off. And when it's sold off over the weekend, uh, I think people pulled in their horns uh, across the board. Right. All right. Well, just over $56,000 at the moment. We shall see what the rest of the week holds. Meantime, we got Netflix coming up tomorrow. What are you watching there? Well, it's it's very interesting. This stock is going to be such an important stock, I think. But this one and uh, Facebook, I mean, uh, it, it comes in about 10 days, uh, they report as well. Because, you know, people, you know, We've well, we've all noticed how tech really hasn't done well uh, in the in the last couple of months overall, uh, with the exception of the semiconductor stocks until today. However, the Fang stocks have done poorly for eight to nine months. I mean, really since the end of last summer. However, even though these stocks have been stuck in a sideways range for a long time, I I, I, st I sometimes believe that, I, that people have basically given up on them. They're thinking, hey, the reopening trade, uh, no people aren't going to buy Netflix any, uh, aren't going to use Netflix as much as they used to. Facebook is, is yesterday's story, but all of these stocks, with the exception of Google, which is already broken out, uh, are are kind of bumping up against the top end of their sideways ranges. So if Netflix can report good earnings and be a catalyst to break out of that sideways range, um, it's going to catch a lot of people off sides. I mean, let's face it, uh, tech stocks uh, in many cases are momentum plays, and a lot of that momentum money has left these names. If this and a stock like Facebook, which is actually slightly broken out of the, its sideways range, can break further out of it, uh, a lot of that momentum money is going to return to this group. So uh, these big cap, uh, mega cap tech names are going to be very, very important. How they react to their earnings reports are going to be very right. important to how the whole tech sector reacts over the rest of the quarter. All right. Well, we're going to be across the mall, starting with Netflix next out of the gate. Matt Maley, Miller Tabak, Chief Market Strategist, thanks so much for giving us your view on what's to come. Coming up on Bloomberg Technology, tech companies in the United States starting a slow return to the office as vaccines ramp up. Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield joining us next to talk about whether a post-pandemic hybrid world will be the new normal. That's next. This is Bloomberg. More people around the world were diagnosed with COVID-19 over the last seven days than any other week since the virus emerged. Cases topping 5.2 million globally, according to Johns Hopkins University. The data also showing a 12% increase in cases from a week earlier, throwing doubt on hopes that the end of the pandemic is at least in sight. There are a number of tech companies, of course, in the United States getting ready for a slow return to the office with limited capacity. Slack CEO Stuart Butterfield, who said employees can work from home indefinitely, joins us now to talk about what the future of work could and should look like. By the way, Stuart, great to have you back with us. It feels like we're on the verge of starting this new chapter, but every time we try to turn the page, somehow the numbers get worse. As a chief executive who's in charge of these thousands of employees, how concerned are you about this? Do you think folks are trying to return to, to work too soon? 
Honestly, I have no idea. I mean, I think that's uh, that's part of the frustration of this conversation. I've been talking to a lot of CEOs, a lot of different companies, different industries. You know, obviously, spend more time with uh, with the software CEOs, but uh, no one really knows. And and there's some strong opinions on some aspects of what happens when we do go back. Um, but in my staff meeting, uh, our head of people, Nadia Rawlinson, had this really important distinction, which I think is kind of critical for how we think about it because we were going in circles, going back and forth and back and forth. And she said, when we talk about what's gonna be different in the future, are we talking about different from today or are we talking about different from February, 2020? And I think most people tend to go uh, back to you know, 13, 14 months ago and imagine what would be different from then rather than thinking about where we are today. And if you think about it in that way, I think it's a totally different picture. So your Future Forum research, you've got this think tank called Future Forum, which is focused on the future of work. You found that nine out of 10 workers don't want to return to the office full time. What should we take away from that? That people want flexibility. I mean, I think there's a huge mix of emotions and, and um, a lot of that's driven by the fact that there's the pandemic is still ongoing and people are stressed about their health. And a lot of the regular kind of amenities of life have been taken away. You can't go to the restaurant, you can't get a massage or to get your nails done. Or When you imagine those things starting to change, I think people's emotional state starts to change. But many companies like ours have, you know, 30% of our employees, 30% plus started post pandemic. So many companies like us have hired a lot of people, um, have allowed people to move, and you can't unscramble that egg. But I think we also realized, despite the fact that we all thought it was impossible, productivity remained high over the course of this year for many organizations. And there's this real desire to get together with people. Um, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that we're going to be going back nine to five. And I don't think that's ever going to happen, honestly. So what does that mean for your workforce? Of course, uh, we know Slack, you've agreed to sell the company to Salesforce, biggest tech deal of the last year. Salesforce is uh, reopening its tower, the big Salesforce tower in May with limited capacity. What's your plan for Slack employees? What's your plan for yourself? How often will you be going back to the office? I think it's a really good question to think about where the, the leaders are going to be. So we've done some limited office um, openings and kind of experiments in places like uh, Australia and, and Japan, where it's a you know, bit of a different situation. But we haven't been able to keep an office open for, for very long before the policies change. I think for myself, given the evidence that our whole team continue to be productive, I want the flexibility. I think there's a lot of people who are in that position. You know, while there's a lot of young people early in their career who want to get back to the office as part of their social life, there's a lot of people who have families and they like the lack of a commute. They like being able to spend a little bit more time with their kids. So people are, are all over the place, but the idea that we're gonna count the number of days that we go back into the office each week, I think is wrong headed. The real question is the extent to which organizations are digital first, because the fact that we managed to do this without our physical offices uh, means that we're able to shift the, the ways in which people uh, collaborate, the ways in which people communicate, the ways in which like productivity actually happens. I don't think any CEO would trade software for offices, but we get to kind of welcome offices back into the mix of how we relate to one another and kind of the tool set that's available for us to uh, get stuff done. So companies like Coinbase have gone all remote forever. There's then the hybrid approach. And then there's companies like Netflix. We, we've spoken about this. Reed Hastings, the, the co-CEO telling me he wants people back when, when they can be back. What does this sort of hybrid world mean for the recruiting of tech talent? Like how hard does that change the war for the, the great people that you want to recruit? Yeah, that's, I think, a really interesting question. And we talk about Netflix or, or Goldman Sachs. The market's going to decide this one, just like the market decides compensation. So uh, some organizations are going to be offering people, you know, work 100% remote, and some people won't like that. Some people want to have an office. Others are going to want the flexibility, and I think that uh, everyone likes options. Options sell for money. So if you have the option, you have the ability to say, you know, I have sick parents, I want to go back east for three months, or I want to live in Tahoe in January and February. If that's can kind of considered a perk or one of the, the uh, deciding factors in how people take their jobs, then I think that's going to decide it for us, regardless of what CEOs want. So uh, 
Let's talk then about how this impacts the product. And obviously Slack has helped keep so many people connected at this time. How do all of these changes, or maybe there's less change, maybe there's gonna be less change than we think. How will that impact usage of the product? How much we're spending time on chat apps or video collaboration yeah. platforms? Yeah, I think it's, our focus um, over the last couple of months has been what both as a company, uh, how we operate internally, and also um, as the developers of our product that many people use, how can we take things that today must be synchronous uh, and make them asynchronous? And the fancy word, but we just mean, when can we kind of decouple people's time to give them some additional flexibility? You know, some people work better in the morning, some people work better in the evening, and obviously everyone's kind of physically exhausted with the eight hours of video meetings. So I don't mean that we eliminate work or even reduce the number of hours necessarily, but make it possible for people to collaborate without having to be on a call at the same time. And we have a lot of exciting stuff coming in there, uh, a feature called Huddles, which is always on audio uh, that allows for more kind of serendipitous or spontaneous conversations, but also trying to find ways to explicitly kind of recreate the value of a meeting, but without requiring that everyone be there at the same time. All right, and just last quick question, Stuart, but before we had to break, obviously we're still waiting for the uh, Salesforce deal to close. Can you give us any updates on where that stands? Unfortunately, I can't. So we're, we're still just uh, kind of standing by and waiting. We're um, happy to work with the regulators and kind of go through the process. Um, so no update, unfortunately, but um, I think both Salesforce and us have always been committed to an open ecosystem and kind of interoperability. And I think that will um, make it easy for people to make a decision. All right, Stuart Butterfield, CEO of Slack. Always good to have you with us. Thanks so much for stopping by. Okay, coming up, we're looking at Tesla and the car that caught fire in a devastating accident in Texas. Why it was so hard for firefighters to put out and Peloton shares slumping after a US safety watchdog issues a warning, a big one for Peloton Tread Plus users. That's next, this is Bloomberg. Two big tech companies at the center of consumer safety questions. We're talking about Tesla and Peloton. First, I want to get to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. Ed, you've got more details on this deadly accident involving a Tesla in Houston, Texas. What exactly do we know and what don't we know at this point? Yeah, Tesla CEO Elon Musk has just tweeted in the last few minutes that the data logs they've recovered from that vehicle in Texas show that autopilot was not enabled at the time that it crashed and that actually the owners had not purchased full self-driving, the beta version of the full self-driving technology. That said, we do know that two federal uh, agencies are going to investigate the crash, which has left two people in the car dead. The, 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 the fatalities were found one person in the front in the passenger seat, another person in one of the rear passenger seats. And the National Transportation Safety Board and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration are going to investigate, particularly focused on the operation of the car, they say, and also the fire that came as a result of the crash. Right. Obviously, what's confusing is that there was no one in the driver's seat, at least uh, the way the car was Yeah, I mean, it comes at a really tricky time found. for Tesla. Talk to though, us right? about the next steps from here. Yeah, right, it, right. Like, talk to us about next steps. I, I mean, in true fashion, Elon Musk was tweeting over the weekend about the progress that Tesla has made in, in autopilot. That now, according to Tesla's own data, when autopilot is enabled, the chance of an accident is 10 times less that of the average vehicle. That is Tesla's own data. They are trying to market full self-driving, which is kind of the next stage of that software, very aggressively. A lot of Wall Street analysts price that in to the current share price on its future potential for full self-driving. And then there's the battery element, the fire element. We know that emergency services have really struggled to deal with battery fires. In this particular instance in Texas, they had to use 30,000 gallons of water to put out the specific fire. Um, and there are a lot of questions already from these two federal agencies about what they will find when they look into this particular accident. All right, well, certainly uh, very devastating, no matter what happened. Um, Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow, thanks so much for that update. I wanna turn now to Peloton, another devastating story and a dire safety warning for owners of the Peloton Tread Plus, the US Consumer Product Safety Commission tweeting over the weekend that consumers should stop using Peloton's signature treadmill because it poses serious risks to children for abrasions, 
fractures, even death. The CPSC saying it's aware of 39 incidents so far, this putting pressure on Peloton shares. For more, let's get to Bloomberg's Mark Gurman from L.A. Mark, tell us more about this. Yeah, this is something that we first heard about a few weeks ago when Peloton announced in an email and on their website to owners of the you know, Tread Plus treadmill that they had determined that a young child actually died uh, in an incident related to the treadmill. At the time, we had discovered that that death was not a one-off occurrence in terms of injury. There was a, another young child who was also badly hurt in an incident related to the treadmill. Now we have these U.S. officials saying that nearly 40 incidents have recently been reported regarding the Tread Plus. And these incidents seem to be related to children and pets. Obviously, you know, those are two things that you wouldn't want near any particular treadmill. But it appears that the combination of Peloton's strong brand and a higher rate of injuries over other treadmills being, you know, attributed to the Tread Plus itself is what is really raising eyebrows here. Uh, with these U.S. officials and, and, and consumers. And it appears thus far that Peloton is pushing back on the idea of a recall, essentially saying that if the device is used properly with the safety precautions that are available to Tread Plus owners, that there shouldn't be an issue. But clearly there is a lot more work to be done here. Okay. Uh, well, I know you're going to continue reporting on developments there. Thanks so much for that update. I do want to get to another story. Apple giving the largely right-wing social app Parler the green light to return to the App Store. What do we know? So this morning, uh, Apple sent a letter to a few people from the U.S. government informing them they are going to allow Parler back on the App Store. Now, if you remember, Parler was initially removed from the App Store as well as Amazon and Google services in January after the app was used to help coordinate the, the riots on, on Capitol Hill uh, before the transition of power to President Biden. And now Apple is saying that Parler is putting in new protections, the ability to block users, improve moderation, that will allow the app to reappear on the App Store. Since then, we've also learned from Google that they are open to putting Parler back on their Google Play Store, their App Store equivalent, if Parler submits a new version of their app that will meet Google's criteria, which is essentially the same as Apple's in terms of content moderation for social media applications. Okay, interesting developments there. Mark Gurman, Bloomberg Technology, thanks so much uh, for sharing all of that with us. All right, coming up, the rise of TikTok. We're going to go behind the scenes on the success story of the Chinese-born mega social sensation. That's next, our special series on TikTok. Up next, this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Technology. I'm Emily Chang in San Francisco. Just there, you were watching a TikTok dance created in sync with the Bloomberg Technology show music. Credit to dancer Katie Wong there. Thank you. TikTok, the most downloaded app of 2020, showing the rise to fame and influence the social platform is having around the globe. Bloomberg Shelley Banjo hosting a new TikTok series, a podcast debuting called Foundering, focusing on the ins and outs of the app and how the Chinese mega startup came to be. I'm joined now by the host of the Foundering Series and our Bloomberg Tech contributor, Shelly Banjo herself. So Shelly, you've been working on this for months. Um, so I know this project is, is incredibly important to you and speaks to the importance of TikTok. How and why do you think TikTok has become one of the most downloaded apps of the year and last year? Thanks so much for having me on the show. You're right. I am so excited about this podcast. You have no idea. It launches on Thursday. And um, it is just chock full with surprising twists and turns because everybody has kind of heard about TikTok. You know it's popular, but you might not use it yet, or you might not really understand the true scope and business story behind it. 
And, you know, people uh, really, ad all adults started really using it during the pandemic, stuck at home. And then once you start using it, you just get addicted to the app in a way that you just don't get addicted to um, with other technology companies. So talk to us about the status of the company. Are they in? Are they out? Uh, are, they, are the regulatory issues with the U.S. government over? Yeah, so the funniest thing looking back at 2020 is amidst the pandemic, amidst the elections, you know, one of the most uh, craziest big news stories of last year was about, you know, is TikTok going to be banned and why and why not? And then all of a sudden these concerns around national security and is this is this app spying on me? Is this data going over to China? All of that disappeared because Trump, um, you know, was uh, left office and the Biden administration basically put an official hold on this whole ban process, the sale process, a bunch of lawsuits. They said, yes, we think that this is a national security risk looking at, but this is not our top priority right now. And so everything is basically put on hold for the time being. So your podcast series debuts on Thursday. What can we expect? What will you explore? Yes, yeah, so this starts at the very beginning um, of the uh, the rise of Musical.ly, which was the app that uh, predated uh, TikTok, and it takes us all the way through the twists and turns, um, how it got how it got big, how it attracted creators, how it became a real force in American culture. Uh, it, it takes you into the backstory of these two really mysterious founders um, in China and how they, you know, really infiltrated music, culture, um, you know, American. Uh, popular American culture and then all the way through the Trump ban and into today. All right, uh, Shelley, stay with us. I want to bring in Eugene Wei, longtime tech investor, former, former uh, Oculus VR, head of video, also worked at Amazon, Hulu back in the day, has written some of the most popular articles on the power of the TikTok algorithm. Eugene, what do you think it is that sets TikTok apart, that has differentiated it from Facebook, Instagram, Snap, Twitter? Yeah, the most fascinating thing about TikTok um, is the fact that unlike most of these other social apps, it doesn't rely on a social graph to build a personalized feed for you. It basically just observes you watching videos in its app and tries to understand your tastes based on your behavior. That's very different from Western social apps, which almost always have you start following and friending people before you start populating a feed. And I think what's innovative about TikTok is that they've recognized that what people really want is content that's interesting to them. Um, I refer to this as an interest graph. And they said, you know, it's, it's more efficient just to directly figure out what interests you rather than trying to guess what interests you based on what people you follow. So the big question is, will TikTok success and magic keep up? Will something bright and shiny, something else come along? Or will Instagram or another um, well-financed competitor somehow steal the momentum? What do you think? Well, I think it's going to be difficult for Western social apps to exactly replicate the magic of TikTok, partially because structurally and by design, as I said, those apps are built differently. And they also have just a lot of competing priorities uh, within their single feed, whereas TikTok is singularly focused on entertaining its users through its feed. The challenge for TikTok, I think, is whether it can continue to broaden out to a larger audience. I would say that the dominant audience for TikTok today is still sort of uh, on the younger side. And while that's great, I think their ambitions are to broaden into uh, an older audience. And that's going to be uh, a bit of a challenge because it means they're going to continue to have to diversify their content types. Shelley, do you think Given all the research that you've done over the last several months, do you think TikTok can broaden into an older audience? Absolutely. And we saw this during the pandemic. You know, these adults who had probably only seen their kids 
using TikTok, start getting into TikTok food, um, you know, cooking on TikTok, uh, investing on TikTok, financial TikTok has been blowing up. Um, you know, all of these things kind of broaden the audience, get people addicted, as TikTok then broadens into e-commerce, live events, streaming. You know, the thing about that TikTok has been able to do is continue to broaden its experience bigger and bigger and bigger, and also to move with the person. So as Eugene was saying, you know, if you started on Facebook as a college student and all your friends were other college kids, and then the people you see on your feed are not that interesting to you anymore, TikTok takes a totally different approach. It's constantly updating to what you're into, what you're addicted to, and continually and continually showing you what you want. As you change, the stuff you see changes. And so the interesting thing about, about that is that you're not seeing the same thing as your friend or your mom or your husband, and you're not seeing the same thing as you maybe saw a year ago. And so that's, that's really why you hear all these people who say, you know, when I first downloaded TikTok, I didn't really get it, and it was really weird, and they kept showing me all those pictures of people dancing. But by two weeks later, I was addicted, and that's because they get to know you, they know how you think, and that's the really kind of scary, but also quite amazing thing about it. Right, TikTok has brought so much joy to people over the years, but also there is this dark side. And Eugene, I wonder what your thoughts are on the problem of addiction, tech addiction or addiction to TikTok in particular, and also some of the, the content on the app, some of the memes that take off that are not healthy, that have plagued other social platforms. Yeah, it's definitely one of the chief challenges in this like sort of algorithmically feed driven age of social media, which is that the amplifying effects of the algorithm uh, can be both good and bad. You know, they can take positive content and really slingshot that, but they can also take negative feedback loops and negative sort of like human behavioral feedback loops and amplify those. I think that's one of the sort of like chief challenges coming out of what I refer to as the first era of social, which I think we're coming to the tail end of. I think the next era of social is, is going to be one in which both users and governments and society as a whole will, will push back harder and demand more of these apps in terms of trying to mitigate some of this. I don't think it'll ever be completely eliminated because, you know, these feeds really reflect, uh, us, like different sides of humanity, uh, both a positive and negative. But I do think you're going to see a more concerted effort to, to be more aware of these things. And whether that's through human moderation or through other sort of like new social regulation features built into the app, try to keep it to a minimum. You know, we're going to be talking about TikTok all week, but Eugene, I'm curious, since this was an app that was born in China, the parent company is a, a Chinese company, how much do you think that matters today? Uh, will that at all hold TikTok back, or do users not know and or not care? Well, I think most users uh, so far are just reacting to whether the app entertains them, and so I, I think that political story is uh, less of an issue for them. I do think it will impact TikTok's future only in that, you know, the United States and China are entering into sort of a, a protracted uh, kind of cold war uh, on, on a number of fronts. And I think there's, uh, there's no way around it that TikTok and ByteDance, its parent company, are going to be caught a little bit in the middle of that. We've seen other companies already impacted. And, you know, as Shelley noted, certainly in 2020, TikTok got taken for a very turbulent ride because of that political dynamic. Uh, that's just, you know, part of the uh, part of the challenge they're going to have to face. All right, uh, Eugene Wei, thanks so much for sharing your perspective with us. Obviously, um, great to have your thoughts. Tech investor, former employee at Oculus, Hulu, Amazon, and our very own Shelley Banjo. Reminder, Shelley's podcast, Foundering, centering on the TikTok story, the TikTok phenomenon comes out later this week on Thursday. We are going to have guests all week long talking about the power of the app, where it's going, what's next. Tuesday, we'll be speaking to TikTok creator Katie Feeney, who's just 18 years old. She made a million dollars on Snap as a Gen Z influencer and now has a career on TikTok. Her story on this show, Tuesday. And coming up, finding the next Silicon Valley in a post-COVID world. Revolution CEO Steve Case joins us next to talk about how the pandemic has changed 
the VC landscape and where he thinks the next tech hub will be. This is Bloomberg. The flexibility to work remotely is opening doors for tech companies and venture capital firms to find and fund talent from all over the country, around the world, really. Revolution's Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, just one example of investors who are looking to help thriving startups located outside of the coasts, or let's say between them. Joining us now for more, Chairman and CEO Steve Case, who believes the opportunity for innovation and talent has become borderless in an increasingly digital world. He's the latest guest in our work shifting series. Steve, you have been shouting this from the rooftop for years. Now, everyone finally seems to agree that talent can be anywhere. How, just let's just say over the last year, how has the landscape changed in terms of what you've seen and where the most innovative companies are being born? Uh, it reminds me of the early days of the internet and AOL, the first 10 years we were talking about the idea of getting everybody online. Most people, frankly, were skeptical. And then finally, you kind of hit a tipping point, and what seemed sort of like a crazy idea suddenly became an obvious idea. And with the rise of the rest, I think it's similar. We've actually been working on this nearly a decade. I've asked my President Obama to chair the Startup America Initiative about a decade ago. We started doing our Rise of Rest Plus tour, I think it was about six, six and a half years ago. And for much of that decade, people were saying, well, it seems like a nice idea, but do you really believe you can build great, iconic, valuable companies outside of Silicon Valley? And now people recognize you can't, probably because there have been some successful ones, but also, as you know, the pandemic has resulted in some people rethinking kind of where they want to live and where they can or want to work. And that has, I think, will have a, over time, a, a real impact in terms of this rise of the rest movement. More of these cities will rise up because people will recognize they have more flexibility than they might have thought they had even just a, a year ago. So do you still see this happening in clusters, in cities where sort of new ecosystems are sprouting up or is it more dispersed? Like, could it be happening anywhere? It's a mix and it really depends on the industry. There's certainly some remote work and you've seen this now already uh, pre-pandemic taking hold. And if as part of this infrastructure bill that likely is gonna pass Congress, rural broadband is included, which it likely will be, that will fuel that and give people more flexibility. But for the most part, there's still something around clustering talent in cities. It just doesn't have to be a few cities like you know, San Francisco, New York, it could be many cities. And our Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, you mentioned, we've actually invested in 150 companies in 70 different cities. And with our Rise of the Rest bus tour, so far we've visited 43, 44 different cities. And we're seeing thing, things happening in all these different cities. It's really remarkable. It's not just a few places that are starting to show momentum as startup ecosystems. It's dozens of, of places. I think that bodes well for the innovation economy more, more broadly. I think it will allow entrepreneurs to be close to some of their customers, close to some of their partners uh, in, in some of the sectors that are ripe for disruption, healthcare, food and ag, things like that. Uh, and, and over time, level the playing field. So again, Silicon Valley, as you well know, is terrific and will continue to be terrific. It's the leader of the pack and will continue to be the leader of the pack, but it's gonna be less dominant in the next 10 or 20 years than it was in the last uh, 10 or 20 years. And this isn't a new idea. We've seen this in other industries. You know, half a century ago, if you wanted to be in the financial services world, you had to be in New York, you had to be on Wall Street. You know, 50 years ago, if you wanted to be in the entertainment industry, you had to be in Hollywood. Now people recognize that what, if right. you want to be in either of those industries, you might choose to be in New York or choose to be in, in Los Angeles, but you don't have to be there. I think the same dynamic we'll see in, in the tech sector and the innovation economy. Silicon Valley will still have some advantage, but many other cities around the country will, will rise up and, and be terrific startup ecosystems. So are there any that are rising up faster than the rest? I mean, we're hearing a lot about Miami. Where do you think the next Silicon Valley is going to be? I think it will be a lot. It won't be just one or two. And everything, I'm asked about that because we have worked in so many cities and invested in so many cities. It's almost like, like asking, who, who's your favorite child? Of course, you never answer that question. And I always duck the, <laughs> what are the next cities? But we've seen a, a number of cities really rise up that really has shown momentum, including some larger cities that a decade ago weren't necessarily known as uh, startup cities. Even Los Angeles 10 years ago, the entrepreneurs was hard to raise capital. Chicago was hard to raise capital. Washington, D.C., where I was, uh, had been based, hard to raise capital. They, those certainly have risen. One of the companies we backed through Revolution Growth in Chicago, Tempest, started five years ago. Now it's 1,600 employees, raised a billion dollars. 
it's, it's killing it. And that's a company right. in precision medicine, big data, people would assume would have to be in Silicon Valley or maybe in Boston, the Cambridge uh, area. So we're seeing that dynamic. I, I give the mayor in Miami credit. He's certainly uh, been a visible evangelist on behalf of the cities. More mayors are doing that. They recognize the future of their cities really are in the hands of startups, creating a lot of jobs and driving a lot of the, the opportunity in different parts of, of the country. But I think people are going to be surprised in the next 10 or 20 years, how many of these cities rise, how many great iconic, you know, multi-billion dollar unicorn companies are in parts of the country that most people uh, even today don't really think of as startup cities. Okay, just about 30 seconds left, Steve. Let's talk about what kinds of companies, what are your top three? You know, what sectors are most promising? We're hearing so much about crypto these days. Where are you placing your bets? Well, health, health tech is one sixth economy. I mentioned Tempest in Chicago, another company we back, Talkspace in the mental health space, actually in the process of going public now uh, via SPAC, a lot of momentum there. Another company we back, Clear, initially focused on airport fast passes, it pivoted, also now has a health pass partnership they announced a couple weeks ago with, with Walmart. So that's a, a big area of continued focus. One sixth of the economy, it's a, arguably the most important aspect of our lives. We're also seeing a lot around e-commerce. We're seeing a lot around uh, the future of work in terms of how it likely will be more of a hybrid uh, kind of work uh, you know, structure. So there are great ideas from great entrepreneurs everywhere. We're just trying to match the capital with those ideas so people have more flexibility in terms of where they want to start and scale those uh, those, those companies. I, I'm, I'm super excited okay. by the progress that's been made in the last decade and particularly sort of this tipping point we've seen over the past year bodes well for the future of America. All right. Well, it's good to hear some optimism uh, in today's world. Steve Case, CEO and chair of Revolution. Steve, always good to have you here. All right. Coming up, we're looking at tech's future in California, specifically how the state is working to retain top talent. That coming up next. This is Bloomberg. Also, we've got a quick look at chip stocks having their worst day in a month. Some of the biggest names down more than 2% in Monday trade. We're going to get a further update on the global chip shortage when Intel reports earnings later this week. California, the epicenter of technology here in the United States, has a new chief technology innovation officer. And what a role he's stepping into, setting the agenda for misinformation on social platforms, tech's role in the vaccine rollout, and talk around a possible EV tax credit. Rick Clow joins us now, serving as California's new chief technology innovation officer after having previously worked as at Google as a senior operating partner. So, Rick, uh, certainly a critical time. You took this role in February. What is it that you want to bring to California at a time when we're navigating our way out of a pandemic, in, not without its controversies, um, that you learned at Google, that you want to bring to the state of California? Yeah, I mean, I think it's important not to think that this is the opportunity to, to make uh, Google uh, part of the delivery of government service. It's really how did we build and ship products uh, and do that at scale in support of the residents of California. So it's a chance to take what I learned and then figure out how to do that uh, from Sacramento, recognizing that, that Sacramento is not Silicon Valley and, and shouldn't be. So how do you think tech can and should be better used when it comes to vaccines, testing, contact tracing? Because in so many ways, it feels like some of these things have been low tech um, in the way that they have rolled out. Well, I think if you look at my turn, which uh, California Department of Technology shipped to the public uh, in just a few days back in January, in the very earliest days of the vaccine rollout, on the first day of eligibility last week, we had more than a million visitors and were serving more than 700,000 appointments every week. Uh, in every one of those is another shot in an arm of a Californian. So I think that the, the pace at which things are moving has been remarkable, given the compressed time we've had to work with. Okay. That said, there's still a huge misinformation battle that folks are fighting, government officials are fighting around the world. How do you intend to fight that battle and how could technology help rather than hurt, given that often this is thriving on tech platforms? 
Well, I think uh, to be fair, uh, my job is to run the Office of Enterprise Technology uh, in CDT, which is really the software engineering team within the California state government. So my job coming into this role is to figure out how do we ship these products and services to the residents of California. Um, I will leave it to the policymakers uh, on issues, very important issues like misinformation that ultimately fall outside of the realm of what my team is responsible for. All right, well, then a last quick question on EVs, hugely important to California, an electric car rollout. Lots of talk about the Biden administration restoring the EV tax credit quickly. What in your mind would be the fairest way to do that from an equity standpoint? Well, uh, it, I think it's important to hit on the last word you used, which is equity has got to be where these conversations start. If anything, uh, one of the most encouraging things I've seen in my time just in the first couple of months in the job is that there hasn't been a single conversation about anything we're building that didn't start with a conversation, a question of, are we being equitable and are we serving all okay. Californians, not just the, those okay. who happen to be the wealthiest? All right, Rick Law, California Chief Technology Innovation Officer, thanks so much. We'll have to have you back to talk about this more. That does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. Coming up later this week, our week-long series on TikTok. Katie Feeney will be joining us, just 18 years old.